Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to check out a really neat looking clock radio combination from the 50s. It has that atomic era or atomic age look to it. So I'll explain all the controls on the outside of the radio, and then we'll go inside the radio and I'll explain exactly how this technology works. So let's get started. In order to find a clock radio that really represented this atomic era, I did hunt high and low. And I think it was a, just a, a pure stroke of luck that I found this particular radio. It really does just encapsulate that entire area right within this radio. It really does echo that era. In fact, I guess other people are thinking this as well, because if you type in general electric atomic era clock radio on, say, Google, this will come right up this particular radio does and it has all the features and just the coloring and the decor of that and I'm really thankful that I managed to find this because it's in such good condition too so it'll make a really good restoration candidate so to give an idea of what I'm talking about which really kind of spells this era out this radio was 1955 1956 is when this the production of this radio was happening they changed the design of this radio a little bit it the case kind of remained the same, but they just changed the face here a little bit. And they also had different colors. They had kind of a, uh, I don't know what you would call it, an ivory, an off-white color. And they came in pink as well. And I remember seeing a pink one, and I'm kind of upset that I didn't grab it at the time. I think the dial was just a little bit different than this. At any rate, in that era, everything was kind of that robin's egg kind of, you know, light blue. And they've, you know, you can see on the case here, they're definitely using it for that. It really was the era of the automobile, the era of the car. And if you look at the, the way that they've designed this with these chrome-like looking knobs here, this looks like a car radio right down here in the bottom. They had all the clocks and everything had this kind of a sundial or sunburst look to them. And you can see that within the clock here. Now, if you remember the furniture from that 50s era, they all had those spindly little legs that were on an angle. Look at the, the plastic extruded area down here. They even put those little plastic extruded areas on an angle. So it kind of looks like that furniture from way back when. So they really did their homework when they put this thing together. They tried to just capture everything from that era and put it in here. And it obviously worked because these went over quite well. You can find these things. They're not all that incredibly rare. I just, I, I think it's just such a great example. If you have a 50s theme room or something like that, you know, this would work perfectly in there. Now, it's really rare to find these things with all the knobs on here. All these plastic knobs here are very frail and they have these long kind of plastic tabs on them. These plastic tabs will break off, you know, if you kind of force the knob at all, if they're stuck. So you want to be very careful with them. And if they've gone missing, they are kind of hard to find. I guess nowadays you could probably, you know, try and 3D print something up. That might work okay if you needed to replace them. But I really don't think, unless you had another parts radio, you would find these. Now, the case pretty much remained the same throughout the production years, but they did change the way the clock looked. And the, there was uh, three knobs that were below it or below beside it if I remember correctly on that other version but you know they they slightly changed the look of it the appearance of it but this one here is kind of nice this has this silvery kind of almost like a dashboard look to it so just a really neat radio now this isn't a bake light and it's not a Catalan radio this is a plastic radio I believe this was made by the General Electric Plastics Division way back when so the knobs are all pretty generic. This controls the volume here. This moves the dial around and the dial on this radio is really neat. And I haven't plugged this thing in yet. I haven't powered it up because it's not safe to do so until these things have been gone through. And I'll explain that here when we look inside. But I'll light the dial up here in the end and hopefully everything is all, all the mechanism in there is still working because they've done something really neat with this dial. So it's kind of abnormal for that time. They really did put that quality into this radio. So, you know, sleep timer here and just, you know, the switch. This is also the switch to turn the radio on. Radio alarm, auto. And then this little knob here says push and then hold. And I'm really not sure what this does. So we'll have to check it out and, you know, discover what this knob does. This here, you know, the standard sleep button. Listen to that. Industrial sized you know, switch inside there to take that morning fist when you had to go to work. 
So, you know, just built really robust. I'm very surprised that there is no cracks in the case. The case itself is in such nice condition. So everything is looking really nice on this thing. So, you know, very good restoration candidate. One of the things to take note of too, if you want to find a radio like this is if the back is bowed in or these are bent up, kind of out of shape, there's a good chance that there's a metal heat shield inside this radio that's missing. These radios really do get hot. There is a, a lineup of tubes inside here and there's a, two tubes in this radio in particular that get extremely hot and they'll cause damage to the case if the actual, if the heat shield itself is missing. So something to, to keep in mind, if you see that it's bowed or these are cracked and bent, there's a good chance that somebody removed that heat shield and it's gone. Had the standard safety interlock cord of the time. The reason that these had an interlock cord is because the chassis on these radios is hot, which means that it's connected to one side of the AC line and the plug itself is not polarized. So you have a 50-50 chance of plugging it in, you know, the right way or the wrong way. So if you plug it in the opposite way, everything inside this radio on the chassis would be on the hot line. So there is a shock danger there. So when these things are to be serviced, you have to have an isolation transformer and you got to be very careful. And I'll go over that when we go inside here. So what I'm going to do now is get out my screwdriver and I'll remove the screws out of the back case. There's only four of them, one here, one here, and there's one down here and one here. And this whole case should just come apart. And we can take a look at many, many years of dust bunnies inside. I'll remove the screws from the case here. So I imagine that these are all original. They're kind of a, a self-tapping sort of screw here. They kind of cut their way into the plastic. There's only four of them. So there's two there. And then we have two on the bottom here. The bottom ones appear to be a little shorter than the top, so something to keep in mind if you're removing these screws. And whenever you're putting these cases back together, never tighten the screws up super tight. Just snug is absolutely fine. You tighten them up too much, and this plastic is well brittle by now, so it'll end up cracking. So we'll just wiggle this here. And we're inside. So that's what it looks like inside. So what I'm going to do is just reposition the camera here and we'll get a closer look. Here's a closer look at the inside of this radio. And immediately you'll notice that they've mounted everything on a circuit board. So yes, back in 1955, they were mounting components on printed circuit boards. Now this is a single sided circuit board and they are kind of delicate. So whenever components are changed on these things, you really need to be careful with your soldering iron in the heat because the traces lift really easily. Something that's even more interesting about this radio is it has an IC in it. Back for 1955, it has one of the earliest integrated circuits. They were called couplets back in the day. They weren't called integrated circuits. So what I'm going to do is get a close up view of that here in just a little bit. And I'll explain how that little IC works. So for those of you that aren't familiar with vacuum tubes, these glass bulbs here are vacuum tubes. And vacuum tubes do pretty much the same job that a transistor does nowadays, except the vacuum tube is much like a light bulb. So in order for a vacuum tube to work, these particular vacuum tubes are indirectly heated vacuum tubes. And that means that they have a filament structure that's inside of a small pipe inside that vacuum tube. And in order for the vacuum tube to work properly, that filament has to heat that pipe orange hot in order for the electrons to flow. And that's why whenever you have a tube device and you turn the thing on for the first time, it takes about 10 to 15 seconds for the thing to warm up before anything happens. And that's because that filament has to heat that pipe up orange hot. And every one of these tubes are indirectly heated. So everyone has to warm up. Now they're all pretty much warming up at the same time. And since there's, you know, this many tubes, I would say the warm up time for this radio is probably going to be about 15 to 20 seconds before any sound really comes out of the speaker. Now, another common thing that people mistake about vacuum tubes is it has a chrome spot on the top of the tube. Some are a little darker than others, but it has a chrome spot. Sometimes it's on the side of the tube as well. That's completely normal. That chrome spot has to be there inside the vacuum tube. 
That's placed there when they manufacture the tube so that when it's glowing throughout its lifetime, that's absorbing any impurities that are leaching out of the metal and any kind of oxygen or anything that's left in the bulb after they evacuate it. And they evacuate the bulbs through these little tips. That's the reason they have these tips on the top. So that absorbs the, absorbs, sorry, in the impurities inside these tubes. So if that gray stuff has gone a chalky white color, so basically it looks like it almost falls off the glass and it's gone chalky white. That means that the vacuum tube is bad. It's, it has air inside it and it's used up the getter compound. So this is called a getter compound inside the vacuum tube. Now, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make when they're testing vacuum tubes is they don't realize that that white chalkiness means that the tube is bad and they plug these tubes into a tube tester and they don't work. So they let them sit in the tube tester for a long period of time. And you know what it does? It burns out the transformer in the tube tester. So when these vacuum tubes have air inside them, it takes a lot more current to try and make that tube light up. And some tubes, the current goes really, really high and it'll destroy a tube tester. So back in the day when a tube serviceman or a radio serviceman came around that was going to change tubes, he would see that and he'd just immediately know that the tube is bad. But, you know, since there's not very much information about these things out there right now, uh, people are trying to test the tubes when they've got a, a white compound in there. And of course, they're just damaging their own equipment. So if you're going to service a radio like this or change tubes and you find a tube that's got kind of a white chalky compound inside, you don't test it. Don't even second guess it. It just is bad. That's the way it is. Now, the scatter compound is sometimes on the side of the tube. They place it all over. And some tubes are even manufactured without that getter compound. But they're the larger power tubes that are used in large transmitters and things like that. And uh, that's a topic for another time. Now, the vacuum tubes in here, again, are much like transistors. They're pretty much doing the same kind of job. This particular radio, since it has five tubes in there in series, this is known as an All-American 5 radio. That's just what they're called. Now, some of these radios were issued with six tubes, and they were called All-American 6s. And those were a little bit more expensive because they had one extra tube that would amplify the signal that comes in the antenna. So this has got a rod antenna under here. We'll look at that here in a little bit. And that extra tube was just to give it a bit of extra RF amplification. So if you lived in a fringe area, something like that, it might be beneficial to have one of those tubes, that, you know, or one of those AA6 radios with that extra tube in it. So the tube lineup for a radio like this is pretty much standard. Some of the radio manufacturers changed things around a little bit. They would, you know, put a different number tube in there to kind of stand out from the crowd, but they're pretty much all the same. So the mixer tube, oscillator and mixer tube, is a 12BE6, and that's this tube right here. The, the mixer tube, or the 12BE6, is usually, I'd say 99% of the time, the closest tube to the main tuning capacitor and the oscillator coil. The IF amplifier tube is a 12BA6, Another, it's just, these are all common. They're used in a gazillion of these radios, all different makes and sizes. So this is a 12BA6. This is known as an IF amplifier. And this tube here is basically taking the signal through this transformer here, amplifying it and putting it into this transformer here. This tube over here is known as a 12AV6. There's actually three tubes in one. There's two diodes and a triode inside this tube. This is a detector and an audio amplifier, a 12AV6. This is a 50C5. This is the audio output tube. This tube drives that transformer down there, which in turn drives the speaker. This tube here and this 35W4 over here are the tubes that get the hottest in the radio. These tubes here just absolutely bake, and you can see it's discolored the circuit board down there. So very, very hot tubes. Now, I was talking about that heat shield earlier in the case. And you'll notice here, just lift this up here for a moment. Right in the case here is that heat shield. This is a metal shield. If this is missing, what'll end up happening is the top will end up melting and you'll get that kind of a saggy, the bars in the top or the plastic case will just end up sagging in. So that's the reason that, you know, the cases get damaged on these is that, that shield goes missing. Again, you can see, if I move this over, you can see the, the circuit board really is discolored down there from the heat. 
So these tubes get very, very hot. Definitely not something that you'd ever want to touch in service that would, you know, just absolutely burn you. These things get very, very hot. This one here and this 35W4. The 35W4 is a rectifier tube. And what that does is that takes the AC line. So the AC is plugged into here through that interlock. And what it does is it takes that, it rectifies it, changes AC to DC to direct current. And then this orange can here filters that out, takes out all the hum. So when you have a radio like this and you turn it on and you know, it starts to really loudly hum, this is the problem right here. And this is what destroys this tube over here. And it'll also burn traces off the bottom of the circuit board, depending on the design and things like that. This component in this radio is the troublemaker. So what this will do is it'll destroy the radio if this is bad here. And you can see it's been really hot. It kind of has a, a waxy kind of goop on the top of it here. So I'm not really too sure if it's, you know, just dripped off of something here. It looks like it may have come out and come around the sides here. So this has been very hot and it kind of has a bubble in the center and it's a little bit discolored as well. So not something that I would want to leave in here and turn on. Again, if this goes bad, it's going to destroy this tube over here. And, you know, I really don't want to destroy any tubes. In the front here, we can see it has a clock. This looks like a shaded pole type motor here. Getting into the explanation of a shaded pole is really uh, a topic for another discussion. So, uh, yeah, it has two big copper bands here and... Uh, this is what drives the clock. So in many of these older radios, these things get noisy because they have a gearbox in them and the gearbox starts to buzz. So hopefully this one here isn't noisy. We can see the switch mechanism on here. Look at the mechanics to that. So big switch. So looks like there's a, some form of a bulb down there under that tape, probably a neon bulb. It looks like it has the standard resistor that would be in line with a neon bulb here. And this looks like some, that button, yeah, it's just a push button switch. It looks like that's all it really is. Is there anything else in there? Mm, it looks like it's just a switch. You just push on it. So I have to figure out what that is for here in a little bit. And the speaker over here. And that's pretty much that. In order to get at that little early integrated circuit or couplet, I need to remove two tubes here. So what I'm going to do is just take this tube out and all you do is just gently rock it. Now it's absolutely fine to touch the glass on these old tubes and they're actually pretty tough. So you don't need to worry about it. It's not one of those things where, you know, you need to get your fingerprints off them or anything. It's just standard glass. And we can already see that I see in there. Look at that. There it is with all its little pins on the bottom. So that's the little I see right there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, some compressed air to this thing and get rid of all of this. It's years of grunge. A lot of this looks like it's, it's kind of a waxy, uh, a waxy compound on the board. And that's because a lot of the components actually kind of had a wax dip from the factory. So the transformer here has a wax coating on it. And then they kind of dip these things in wax as well. And from the heat from these tubes from years and years and years, it gets onto the board and runs around and it makes this dirt really just kind of stick to the board so I'll blow out the dust and everything get that all cleaned off and I may have to use a somewhat of a an aggressive chemical to get the rest of that off to clean it up really well so so what I'll end up doing is removing all the tubes I'll take this one out as well they come out relatively easy and I'll get in there and start cleaning things up in order for me to get the chassis out, I'm just going to desolder these wires here first. So what I'll do is I'll apply some solder to this first, right into this big fuzzy kind of mess that's going on in here. You might be asking me, why don't you clean the fuzz off the terminals first? And my answer would be because it really doesn't matter. So it's just going to get inhaled by a desoldering tool at any rate. So I'm just adding a lot of solder to the tip here so just fresh solder and then what I'm going to do is grab my desoldering tool here and get it down here and inhale all of that the reason that I'm adding fresh solder is because the old stuff won't take very well this looks like it'll probably just come right out there it is and I'll do the same for this whenever you have old dirty solder joints like that it's beneficial to add 
new solder to it just in order so that they you know so it comes out a little bit easier and not only that desoldering them like this leaves the holes open so that when you want to put this back together you can just put the two wires back in and away you go so that's these two wires I have to remove this one brown wire here and then the two off the speaker jack and after that the chassis should come out oh and the knobs themselves are made out of metal the uh, the knobs on the front you can hear them so really heavy too so lots of quality behind that so cast something or other you can see that they've cast a bunch of numbers into these things so lots of quality there those should clean up really nice as well the chassis removed from the radio and it came out easily so these two wires that you saw me desolder this one down here the two speaker wires and the four screws on the bottom which are here here over here and over here and then of course the removal of those two knobs I think just slides right out so it's really dirty and this makes it much much easier to clean this entire chassis up now if I use any kind of a you know a harsher chemical I need to be very careful because there are plastic pieces on here and I definitely don't want to get any on this because this is a plastic as well and actually it's kind of uh, tinted plastic and light shines through it so that's one of the neat things about this dial is this dial points light behind the pointer no matter where you tune the dial so really neat system so what I'll do is I'll just tune the dial here you can see the entire light mechanism moves with the needle up here and it shines that light through this tinted plastic and just lights up that portion of the dial very neat system so you can see on the bottom here this is that tube that gets very very hot this is the audio output tube and you can even see that the soldering has gotten crusty around the pins there so take this a little closer to the camera you can probably see that it's broken actual solder itself is broken around the pin yeah you can see it right there and it's like that all the way around so some aren't as bad as others this one's getting pretty crusty as well so what I'm going to do is get under here and re-solder most of this board they did a really nice job on this board look at the conformal coating and everything it's nice and green and really nice circuit board for 1955-56 era that's for sure so and then I'm gonna to have to replace this capacitor here now I would like to clean this up and leave this on the upper portion of the chassis so this looks completely factory so I might install a few new capacitors on the bottom side and then just hide them underneath the chassis now I need to be careful when I'm doing this just because when I move this you can see that the capacitor is right here right so this is gonna you know go right over top of it so what I'm going to do is I might have to actually move the capacitors out of the way a little bit. I'll see how that goes. When I have that all in here and figured out, I'll show you exactly what I've done. The upper portion of the circuit board has been cleaned and all the components have been cleaned on the top as well. I've removed the main filter capacitor here and cleaned it up. Now this isn't going to be in service. This is just going to be on the upper portion of the circuit board for looks. There will be two brand new capacitors hiding on the underside of the chassis so this capacitor is completely disconnected on the bottom side of the circuit board i've also removed both of the if transformers one sits here and one sits here the reason i've done that is these if transformers develop a thing called silver mica disease and really what that is is just the migration of metals so what happens is is they've pressed two capacitors into this plastic base here and over time they become intermittent and it makes a staticky sounding radio and sometimes the receive even drops right out so while this is all apart I may as well go in here and basically just disconnect those capacitors that are pressed into the base here and then put two brand new ones on the top and I'll show you exactly how I do that so this is one transformer here and the other one here and they would both sit right in there in order to get one of these IF transformers apart it really is quite easy so most of the mechanical strength that holds this thing together really is the circuit board itself so you know these four pins are soldered into the board and then this little tab here holds everything nice and solid so this really is a soft aluminum shell and all you need to do is just flatten out these little punch marks and that holds this little plastic base inside the aluminum here so if you get just a pair of needle nose pliers and then put it on the side here and then just give them a good squeeze it usually flattens them out if you do that all the way around this will just come out relatively easy so all you need to do is just grab one of the pins here 
and just rock it back and forth and just pull it out nice and straight like this and you're in. Now, in order to take the rest of this apart, it's a good idea to mark everything like you see that I've done here. So each one of these pins here on the bottom have a number to them. You can see one, two, and then this is three and four here. There's a five and a six in there. I think that there were uh, extra pins that could have been added, but um, not to worry about, just ignore those. Just go for the, you know, the numbers that are closest to the pins. And then what you wanna do is usually there's a wire that exits on the top of the coil and one that exits on the bottom. So what you do is you just mark the pin number that the wire corresponds to. It's pretty simple. What I've done is I've also drawn a line here as well. So you can see there's a, a line. So when I put this thing back together, I can align everything up nice and easy. And this says mix on it. I just wrote mixer here. So this is the one closest to the mixer tube. They're both really the same coil, but it's nice just to put them back in the same spot again. So you can see the corresponding. This one here actually exits mid coil and then one exits on the bottom here. So I marked them both on the bottom, but the wires are very close to the number. So it makes it very easy. Another thing that's kind of a bonus is when you desolder these, what you want to do is, you know, use a, a nice fine pair of tweezers or something like that, heat the pin and then just carefully unwrap the wire. It comes off relatively easy. And then if you just leave the wire in this spot and you do this with this one and then, you know, all the way around, when you take this out, the wires are just kind of hanging in the same area. So when you put the coil form back in, and if you align this little line up, all the wires will just point to the right pin. So it really does go together quite easily. So what I'll do is I'll just desolder all these wires now, and then we'll go inside the base here and I'll show you exactly what they've done with those little mica capacitors down in there. Now that all the wires have been desoldered, it's relatively easy to take this out. This really isn't mounted in here in any way that's solid. It just kind of has a split in the bottom. And all you do is you just wiggle this very carefully and pull it straight up. And you can see how the wires, they kind of just stay formed. See how the wires, they just kind of stay formed. So when you put it back in, it'll just fall right back onto the right pin again. So it's still a good idea to mark them though. Because if you don't, you bump it, you know, it could be a little bit of grief. When I put these back together, I usually do put just a little bit of super glue on here, just a tad on each side. And then when I put it in, I make sure it's nice and centered in there. A real problem with these is if the little powdered iron slugs inside here, which are what adjust these coils, if they get a little bit tight, what ends up happening is sometimes this spins inside this. So it'll start to turn around. They have a little guide but that's sometimes not enough then it'll run over that guide and what happens is if this spins it pulls all these wires off inside so it's just a little bit of added protection if you need to ever get a slug out of here not a big deal wind the top one out and then take the bottom one out of the top so that's a nice little fix that i found works pretty good so what i'm going to do is just move this off to the side here where it's nice and safe put it in an area where the wires really aren't going to get too bent up. Now, a lot of these, they haven't marked the capacitors on the schematic. And it's a good idea to just measure the capacitor inside. Usually there's one, sometimes they're both good at the time, but it's, again, it's always good to, you know, check and replace them. And that's what we're doing right now. So what I'm going to do is I've marked the one of the coils comes to these pins here and the other coil comes to these pins here. And I've, I've illustrated two dots here and it also makes it a little easier when I'm putting the new capacitors on the top again. I can just look for the two dots and I know that one cap goes across here and the other one will go across here and I'll show you that here in a bit. So it's very standard for the capacitors in these to be around 100 picofarad. All right, it's just a, a standard. You know what? If it's 90, if it's 110, don't worry about it. Even if it's, you know, even a little lower than 90, not a big deal. Just use a 100 and it'll be absolutely fine. You don't need to get too incredibly picky with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go get a capacitor tester and actually see if these are both good in here before I pull this base apart because the capacitors are hiding right down in here. So I'll just go grab that tester and I'll be right back. In order to test the capacitors in this plastic base here, it really is quite simple. You need to remove the coil form to do this, or at least remove one of the coil wires because the coil is going to short the capacitor, right? So the capacitor is across each coil. 
So with the coil removed, all I'm going to do is just take these two leads and then just poke them into this area down here on the tester. And that should tell me what the capacitor is on one of the sides inside this little plastic base here. So I'll put my meter on to 200 picofarad here. Now you'll see that I have 3.3 picofarad of capacitance here. That's standard for a meter like this. Basically it's measuring the capacitance between these two areas right here. So you just take it away from the count. You know, we're not dealing with anything that's super high accuracy here anyways, right? So I'll just put this into here like so. So I'll just press this in like that. And I don't want to touch these here, so I'll hold it over on this side and we'll see what we get. And that's 110 picofarad. So if we take away 3.3, we're dealing with 106.7. Not a big deal. So it's 100 picofarad, right? It's just moved. That's all. So these would be a standard 100 picofarad capacitor on each side in here. And you know what? 99.9 .9 of these things are like that in these All-American 5 radios that have a 455 KC IF. So in order to get the base apart, what we have to do now is we have to get rid of this plastic. What they've done is they've heated the plastic here and just kind of pressed it over the sides. So when I'm done removing the capacitors here, what I'm going to do is just use some super glue to hold this back into place. There will be no capacitors under here and I'll end up putting the capacitors on the top where it's easily serviceable in the future again. So in order to do that, what I need to do is just clip this plastic off of here. You might want to put on some glasses while you do this because it's kind of brittle and it'll fly off. So just make sure that you protect your eyes. There's that one there. And basically you're just going to work your way around like so. Comes off relatively simple. Another nice thing is to have a, a good pair of, of sharp clippers something that's going to get into here. You don't want to be using any kind of a dull clipper. You don't really want to damage anything on here. You want to put this back together properly again. Some of them will be a little bit harder to get at than others. As you can see here. And one more and I'm in. And that's why you want to wear glasses. Okay, so now what you're going to want to do is take a small jeweler screwdriver here and just pop it under here. Get this out of here like so. And there's the mica capacitors. Now you can see why this would have an issue. Look at what's happening here. All right. Now these are just pressed into place with these tabs. There's a tab on the bottom from one of the pins and then there's a tab on the top from the other and then the pressure just holds these together. So I'll show you what I mean here. I'll just bend one of these up. That's the only thing that's actually holding these things in place. So that's the connection and you can see the connection area here. You can see that the connection area is a little bit here and a little bit here and that would be it. So you can see where a staticky connection would come over time. You can see how this is discolored. You know, for, again, you know, dissimilar metals, right? And they're just not jiving anymore. And this is what creates that staticky mica problem in most of these older radios. Now the fixed mica capacitors are fine because they're sealed. But this here, again, you know, this is just basically a press fit. And uh, that creates issues. So what I'm going to do is just move this one out of the way like so. And then just bend them up like that. And then this is just a little piece of mica with basically the capacitors right on it. We've removed both capacitors here. So if you look closely at this, you can really see the contact area of each entire strip. That would be the contact area there. You can see the contact area there, right? there. This one here had a, a little larger contact area, it looks to be. And you can see how it's discoloring here, almost tarnishing. So that would, you know, definitely make a bad, bad connection. And that's going to lead to problems. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clip these back here and I'm going to press them back down into place. And I'll do that off of camera here. I'll clip these and I'll show you exactly what I've done. And then uh, I'll reassemble this. 
I've taken these tabs in the base here and I've just cut them short just a little bit. There's a little bit of a gap there. The reason that I've actually left the tab in place is just for mechanical strength. You can see that I can move the pin up and down here. So when I put this back on top here and glue it in place, this isn't going to move around. It's going to be nice and solid. Now, the reason that you have to cut them short is if you remember correctly, they overlap like this. And if you were to press this back on top, you just create a short circuit condition without that little mica spacer in the middle. So very important to have that little gap between there. So if you want to cut them, you basically just bend them up, cut them and press them back down again, just that easy. Now what I'm going to do is put this back in here again. So what I'm going to do is locate the line. You can see I've got a line here and there's a line on here. So I'll just put this on top like so. Just press it back down into place. And then what I'm going to do is just flood this area with some super glue and that'll hold this nice and tight. Now the super glue that I use is extremely strong. It bonds very fast. And uh, it's uh, don't use any kind of a cheap, cheap super glue. Use a decent quality stuff and uh, you'll get good results. The stuff I use will basically turn this thing into a solid block. So that'll be uh, nice and strong for reassembly. And then what I'm going to do then is take the little coil, align it up again. So what I'll do is I'll look for that little line on here, which is right here. And then I would just put this back in and align it up. Now I put just a little bit of super glue on here as well. And then when I put this back in here again, it holds it nice and tight. You can see that, you know, it really isn't all that incredibly tight. And if one of these little powdered iron slugs in here got a little bit tight, there's a chance that this could twist. And if it does, it's going to tear these wires off of these posts. You definitely don't want to do that. So that works very, very well. You know, don't go crazy with the super glue on that. Just, just a little bit on each side put it in and uh, make sure it's nice and straight and square and you should be fine. So I've got the other one done and I'll just show you that here. So this is the other one and the capacitor now is just a cross on the upper side. Now the capacitors that I use, I've got some really good surface mount. Oh, they're a 1206 parts is what they are. I was going to say 0603, but they're actually 1206 parts. And uh, I just soldered a little wire onto each side and I mounted them here. Now these are NP0 style capacitors. These are rated at 500 volts and they're 100 picofarad. So very, very good replacement capacitor for what was in there. Definitely want to use something that is either a mica or an NP0 style capacitor for this. So what I do is I solder the little wires on each side of the capacitor like that. And then I just... I put a little bow in there to thermally decouple the capacitor when I'm soldering it in here because I do have a, I have a solder connection here and a solder connection here. So if it's too close to this, when I solder this, there's a chance that this may desolder. So adding that little bow in there gives a little bit of thermal decoupling and they solder in just fine. And that's how they go back together. So this is super glued together and that is solid. So that'll be a, a nice solid transformer. I'm ready to test the clock in this All-American 5 radio. So I have an isolation transformer attached to the clock motor. That isolation transformer is also current limited, just in case there's something wrong with the windings in the motor or something like that. So whenever you're working on an All-American 5 or All-American 6 radio, it's absolutely important to have an isolation transformer in line with this. So you always want an isolation transformer between the line and the device under test, which happens to be the radio. The reason being for all American five and all American six radios is that one side of the chassis is attached directly to the line. So you have a 50, 50 chance of putting the chassis of this radio on the hot side or on the neutral side. Now, if you attach a piece of test gear and the chassis is on the hot side, you're going to see a very big flash and bad things will happen to your test gear. And if you're between it, something very bad will happen to you as well. And you don't want to, you know, experience any really bad electric shocks that could be fatal. So again, you need to take all these precautions. If you're unfamiliar with isolation transformers, I suggest you do a little bit of research on them and find out why they are so incredibly important. And if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Just take care. Know the risks and precautions of working with this particular type of a chassis. Again, you know, there is a 50-50 chance of putting that chassis hot just by plugging in the plug the wrong way because the plugs aren't polarized. Both of the, uh, the prongs on the plug are the same size. So you can 
put it in this way or put it in this way. So what I'm going to do is turn on the power supply right now and we'll see if the clock works. So here we go. And it does. And it's quiet. It's dead silent. That's really nice. Usually these things get noisy over time. So, which is a really good indication that there's probably really low time on this. Which makes me wonder if the dial light works. So this activates the dial light by looking at the switch and behind it, it's attached directly to the lamp in there. So what I'll do is I'll turn off the lamps here and I'll see if the dial light works. And no luck. This little area right here is the lamp circuit for the clock dial. So right underneath this little cover right here is a little bulb that's shining into the corner of this piece of plastic right down here. There's a little piece of plastic. You can see the edge right here. And that's acting as a light pipe and it's carrying the light up to the clock dial itself. So kind of like a fiber optic effect. The reason that they have this little cover here is to stop the lamp from shining into the main tuning dial and to also reflect all of the light into that piece of plastic because the little bulb under there really isn't all that bright. So whenever you see a bulb that's in series with a resistance value like this, I'll explain this value here in just a moment, that usually indicates that it's a neon bulb. And that was really common way back when to light up clock dials. So I've got a new neon bulb right here. This is what a neon looks like. These are still pretty common today. They're used in coffee maker switches and in hair dryers and heaters and things like that. And it's a little glass bulb, two electrodes inside with neon gas in here. It's actually a mixture of gas. And then they seal the top and it glows a nice kind of mellow orange color. Not very bright, but you know, bright enough to be used as an indicator. Very dependable bulbs when they're, you know, hooked into circuit properly. So the reason that this thing here isn't working is really kind of odd. Maybe the it wasn't sealed properly. Right at the base here, they have to seal the wires into the glass. And sometimes they develop a leak there and then, you know, they draw air and then it's finished. So it's probably what ended up happening with this. At any rate, it'll get replaced with this little bulb here if the resistor isn't the problem. Now, there has to be a current limiting resistor in line with neon bulbs. You can't attach a neon bulb directly to any source. Reason being is because when the neon bulb itself lights up, it draws heavy current once it's lit. So we need a current limiting resistor and that's what this does. This acts as that current limiting resistor. Now this resistor here is a carbon composition resistor, which is very common for the day. We have three colors on it and then an area with nothing and then the end of the resistor body here. So that tells us that we read the value this way. We read the value towards the gap. So orange is the number three. We have orange, orange, and orange. So the last band is the multiplier. So basically you take that number and just turn it into zeros. So we have three, three, and three. So we have three, three, and three zeros. So 33,000 ohms is the resistance value. Now, most modern resistors have a fourth band, which is either silver or gold. That's very common. Uh, sometimes you'll get ones that are red as well, seen on things like metal film resistors and, you know, resistors like that. That fourth band indicates the tolerance of the resistor or how much the resistance value can vary. So if this had a silver band, silver represents 10%. It can be within 10% of this value. So gold would be 5% and red would be 2%. Those are the most common fourth bands that you'll find on a resistor. Now, finding resistors like this nowadays with no fourth band is very uncommon. They just don't make them anymore. They always have that band. So since this doesn't have a fourth band, this is considered as 20% is the tolerance of this. So we have 33,000. So we, if we take away 20%, we get 26,400 ohms would be the low end and 39,600 ohms would be the top end. So if we were to measure this, this could be within that range and this would be considered good. Now, this is just in series with a neon bulb. It doesn't have to be an accurate device at all. And that's the reason that they probably used a resistor with no fourth band. Again, penny pinching, right? You don't need that fourth band for something that's gonna be just lighting a neon bulb and they could probably save a little bit of money. When you're making, you know, tons and tons of these radios, you know, that's just a little bit of added savings, I guess, for, for them right there. 
This particular style of resistor is often referred to as an Allen Bradley style carbon composition resistor. It's the one with the sharp ends. So it's sharply cut off on each end. I'll go into more detail in some other videos about these. Across the neon bulb, we have a little green disc style capacitor. And the reason that they've put that capacitor down there is to eliminate uh, basically contact noise. So when you're pressing that little switch, the radio doesn't go crack, crack, or pop, pop when you press it. And a lot of the time when these bulbs go intermittent, they'll flicker or flutter. So if this bulb is fluttering, that's going to be putting a noise into the receiver. So it'd be going crackle, crackle, crackle every time it's flashing and popping. So this here is just a noise filter. That's the only reason that they have that there. And that's a really good idea to have. If they would have skipped on this and the, you know, the bulb became intermittent, it would make a horrible sounding radio since it's right next to the antenna. You know, the antenna sits right over here, right? And you have all of this acting as, you know, antenna wire in here. As we can see, the resistor is fine. 30.6K ohms is well within tolerance. That means that that little neon bulb is faulty. So I'll get in there and replace that. I'm gonna remove the entire clock out of the case so I can clean the dial face as well. And I'll use that as an opportunity to get at the gearing here and lubricate the gears of the clock as well. Now you need to be very careful with the lubricants that you use, especially around plastic gears. You only wanna use silicone based lubricants. If you use any kind of a standard lubricant on a plastic gear, there's a good chance that it will deteriorate over time. So something to keep in mind. I'm also going to clean the radio's dial face right here. I need to be very careful around this. Sometimes the ink that they use on the inside here rubs off very easily. Now, if the radio has been exposed to sun for any length of time, sometimes this even turns into a chalky like substance and basically almost turns into a powder and it'll fall right off. So you want to be very, very careful when you clean the radio's dial face or anything with any kind of numbering or lettering on it. Some radios even use water decals. So if you get water on them, they're just finished. So if you're going to clean a radio dial like this, test in an inconspicuous area. I found in some cases where the, the numbering is very fragile, I've had to work around it very carefully with a Q-tip and clean it like that. Some need to be cleaned dry. Some can be cleaned wet. No harsh detergents or anything like that. It has to be very mild. If you can get away with water alone, I would strongly suggest that. The radio is all finished and pretty much ready for an IF alignment at this point. So everything went back together very nicely. On the bottom portion here, you can see I've mounted the new capacitors underneath the chassis. There's lots of room to spare there. You'll notice a bunch of changes the factory capacitors are rated at 150 volts. That's their maximum working voltage. These ones are rated at 450 volts. So whenever you're replacing a capacitor, you can always go higher in voltage, but you can't go lower. The reason I'm using 450 volt caps is just because I have a lot of these. So I'll just use two of these. So this basically is just giving me a very large safety margin. These capacitors are really overrated for what they're doing. No harm in that, there's no bean counters here. You'll also notice that the capacitors are rated at 47 microfarads each. Now, in the early designs of this radio, they had a capacitor mounted in the bottom side here. When the capacitors mounted in the bottom side, things were more point to point wired. In fact, they had capacitors under here as well, paper type capacitors, paper and foil. Now, the factory schematic had two 50 microfarad capacitors and they were tied in exactly where they need to be. What they've done is since they've taken everything and put it on top of a circuit board and they've moved the capacitor way over here, chances are they may have got a little bit of hum in the circuit because they couldn't attach the capacitors directly where they needed to. So they probably upped the capacitance value as a patch. Now, 70 microfarad is a little bit tough on the cathode of the 35W4 tube. That's kind of pressing it a little bit. So what I've done is I've stuck with the earlier design. I would much rather have two 50 microfarad capacitors under here. It's a little bit easier on the rectifier tube. And since they're tied in where they need to be tied in, they're not in a remote location and there's no long ground runs over here, this here should be absolutely fine. The only ill effect that would happen by having this different value here is that the speaker would have hum present in it. 
and I don't think it will. I think it'll be absolutely fine. Again, these are where they're supposed to be in circuit. They're not in a remote location. There's no leads leading you know, or traces leading way over to it. And they also had the ground way over on the other side of the board kind of attached to, you know, where the IF cans were and everything. So again, you know, they did that to fit everything on the board. And I believe that that extra capacitance was probably just a patch. We'll find out when we put power to it at any rate. I'm ready to apply AC to the radio to see if it'll work before an alignment, which would be kind of nice. There's a bunch of different alignment points on all American five radios. And I'll explain those when I'm going through the IF alignments. Those other alignment points are very simple to align. Now, it's absolutely important to have an isolation transformer in line with one of these things before you apply any AC, just because there's a risk of the chassis being hot. If you're unfamiliar with All-American 5 radio topology, I strongly suggest you do any research before you work on one of these things. If you're unsure about what you're doing, don't work on it because there is a shock hazard. So if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Just take care. Now, there's no switch in this thing. The switch isn't on the volume control. It's actually in the clock dial itself. So I have to bypass that particular section. So the switch wire comes right down to the top portion of this resistor right here. So I've tied in here. And the other one is, the other lead is just tied into the jack in the back here. So what I'll do is I'll turn on the AC supply. And it'll take a few moments for it to come up because it's a vacuum tube radio. Give it a bit of volume too. Be nice if it comes to life. And it's coming to life. Nine four nine radio. Yes, in health, bad guy. You can see how that light behind there kind of tracks in the dial as you move the dial. Really neat little setup that they have on this. It is receiving before an alignment, which is a really good sign. A little bit of crackling in there. Ah, uh, there we go. This mechanism is just floating on the chassis. So what they should have done is added a ground strap, a flexible ground strap from this thing to the chassis. That probably stopped that. So let's see. If I grab one, I'll just clip this to the chassis here convenient area in the back and to here see that fixes the problem completely what's happening is there's a little clip on the back side just turn this down there's a little clip on the back side which is basically spring tensions the bulb into place and that's just dragging on the chassis as this moves back and forth so that should actually have a little flexible piece of uh, you know a braided wire or something on there so that if this does move around, it doesn't make that, you know, crackly noise, right? So right now, this is just grounded to the chassis to keep it quiet. So if I remove the ground, I don't know why they wouldn't have added that. I'm ready to perform an IF alignment on this small receiver now. The isolation transformer is attached to the mains. This is attached to the isolation transformer, so this is completely isolated from the mains right now. And that's very important because the common lead of my signal generator is attached directly to the frame or to the chassis of this radio. The signal lead of the signal generator goes through a 12 picofarad capacitor directly into the antenna tuning portion of this main tuning capacitor. This variable capacitor portion tunes the rod antenna. This portion of the capacitor tunes the oscillator. The signal generator is set to 455 kilohertz. It's modulated to 50% with a 1000 cycle tone. The output of the signal generator is set to 10 millivolts. And that's available right here. Now, the output can vary a little bit. You're just looking for a comfortable signal that will get through the IF chain. 
Now, any oscilloscope will work, even a VTVM or analog movement meter will work for this. This is another little trick to make a nice clean signal on your oscilloscope. You have to remember that this receiver right now is trying to receive as normal. It's just that it has 455 KCs coupled into the antenna section. So that'll create a very noisy trace on the oscilloscope. So what this does here, this is acting as a low pass filter is what this is doing. So we have basically a fake speaker here. So this is just acting as a load across the audio output transformer. So this is a two 15 ohm resistors in parallel. Now the speaker is eight ohms, it can be close. You know, if you have six ohms worth of resistance, that's fine, or nine ohms, it's fine. As long as the, the audio output transformer is terminated. What you want to do is put a 470 microfarad capacitor across these resistors here. So basically right across the audio output transformer. And what that's going to do is that's going to knock out all the highs. And the highs is the staticky noise and things like that. And that'll really clean up the trace on an oscilloscope. And if you're using a VTVM to do this measurement as well, it'll just steady up the needle. Now, the radio has to be right at 1600 kilohertz or 1.6 megahertz to do this alignment. Reason being is because this apparatus that's attached to the needle that moves the light around here has to be right between the two IF transformers so that we can access the bottom slugs on these transformers because there's four adjustments. There's one on the top, one on the bottom, one on the top, and one on the bottom of each IF transformer. So what we want to do to start is we want to make the receiver as quiet as possible. We want to take away its sensitivity. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this little capacitor here and we're going to tighten that screw up. And by tightening that screw up, it's going to really reduce the sensitivity of the receiver. So basically just slip a screwdriver in there and just snug it tight and that'll quieten things up. It's the first thing that we want to do. In the end, we're going to have to unwind that again and tune that in order to Bring the receiver sensitivity back up. We'll worry about that later. It's a very simple adjustment. So the next thing I'm going to do is take my oscilloscope probe here. We'll take a look at the scope. I'll just move this over here a little bit. So I'll attach my oscilloscope commonly to the chassis because the audio outputs common goes to the chassis as well audio output transformer and I'll click the signal lead or clip the signal lead of my oscilloscope to the positive side here like so and if you look at the oscilloscope you can see that there is a sine wave on there that sine wave is an audible sine wave that's a 1000 cycle tone that's coming out of that audio transformer now you can vary the amplitude by adjusting the volume control so if you adjust the IF and you find that it starts to get really big, you're gonna be able to turn the volume down. You can see I can adjust the amplitude. You can see it starts to look kind of like a sawtooth almost there. That means that it's overdriving. So what we're gonna do is just turn this down onto the, you know, to a comfortable level till we have a nice clean sine wave. And then I'm gonna take my adjustment tool here. Now I've adjusted the bottom slugs on these transformers just because this is very hard to do on camera and maneuver everything. So I'll just adjust the top slugs and that'll give you an idea of what to look for. So you need an insulated tuning tool. It's very important. You don't want to use any kind of a metal tuning tool in this because the slugs inside these transformers, the slug is just another name for the adjustment. It's a powdered iron core and they're brittle like glass. So if you break one of these things by sticking a metal screwdriver in, what happens is they crack in half inside that cardboard tube in there, or that paper tube. So when you want to move it, when you stick a screwdriver in there and turn it, it presses the two halves apart and it acts like a break in that little core and they're very hard to get out. So you don't want to take any chances by using a metal tool and not only that, some metal tools are a little bit magnetic and that'll also detune this when you stick the tool in there and when you remove the tool you'll notice that it'll go back into tune. So you got to use a plastic tool on all of these. It's better to break this little plastic tip than it is to break that slug. So in the future I'm going to do a complete video on removing broken slugs out of transformers and 
And if you have a seized IF transformer or an RF transformer with a powdered iron core or slug in it, I'll go over that as well, how to basically free up those cores. So what we're doing right now is if you take a look at the oscilloscope screen, we're looking for the highest amplitude is all we're looking for. So you can use any old oscilloscope for this, old vacuum tube oscilloscope. I've got one from the 30s that would work just fine. So you're just tuning this. So you're going to turn this one way. So now we know that we're going the wrong way because we want more amplitude. So we're going to turn the screwdriver the other way. And you can see how that's getting large. We just tune it till we get a peak. If we pass the peak, we go back and bring it to the peak just like that. Now for the second adjustment, we would go on the underside and poke this through the underside and tune for a peak again. Now we can jump right over to this other transformer and tune the bottom slug on it as well because we're just looking for maximum amplitude. And then we would come back up to the top here again and then we would adjust this. So it doesn't really matter the order as long as you start with this one here because this one is closest to the signal. So we want to peak this one first and then we go over to this one. This one is closest to the output. So I'm going to drop the screwdriver in to this little slug here and I'll tune this for maximum signal as well. And you can see that we're out on both. Right about there is the maximum. So once you've peaked everything and you've tuned for a maximum, it's a good idea to just to go over it one more time. So we would start here again and just make sure that we're at our maximum. Right about there is the maximum. And our IF would be tuned just that easy. So you always want to start with the IF transformer closest to the signal. And again, you go from the top to the bottom. If you want, you can jump from the bottom to the bottom on this one and then come back to the top. It would be absolutely fine. Now I'll demonstrate the importance of tightening this up. If there is a radio station at the top end here, you'll start to see that trace on the oscilloscope jump around. So I'll just loosen this back up so the receiver gets sensitive again. And you can see how it's starting to jump around a little bit. If I actually tuned this into a radio station that was active, it would be very hard to tune this because there would be so much movement here. I'll just try and move this over a bit. I can find a radio station or something. You can see that. So that's the whole idea of basically reducing the sensitivity here. This adjustment here adjusts the oscillator tracking. So if the needle isn't aligning to what's said on the dial face, so say this was supposed to be at a thousand uh, kilohertz, all right? So, and it was sitting off at maybe 1200, you would adjust this. First of all, you would tune this to 1000, make sure it's right on 1000. And then you would tune this until you hear 1000 kilohertz or 1000 AM, one megahertz. You, until you hear that, until it's right on frequency, and then that adjusts the dial tracking. This is usually done at the top end of the band, so you usually align this up at 1600. You can use a signal generator for this as well if you want, or you can just use a local radio station. Now, in order to tune this back up again, what you would do is just tune this right to the top end of the band. Very simple, and then all you need to do is tune this for maximum hiss or noise. So you really don't need a signal generator to make this sensitive again. You just tune this until it gets really static or noisy. And I'll demonstrate that here in a little bit. If you want to use a signal generator to do this, it's absolutely fine to do that as well. You can monitor the output on the oscilloscope the exact same way that we're doing this right now. I don't have any radio stations up at 1600 AM that are close enough to actually do this alignment. So basically just static and noise right now. So I'll just use my signal generator instead. So what I've done is I've just loosely coupled my signal generator right close to the antenna wire. The signal generator is now at 1600 AM or 1 1.6 megahertz, however you want to look at that. That's modulated to 50% by that 1000 cycle tone that we were using for the IF alignment. And I have the output just set to a comfortable level to where the radio will hear the signal generator. So what I'm going to do is turn up the volume here you hear the static. The radio is pointing right at 1600 AM right now, and it's not hearing the signal generator, which means that the 
oscillator is out of alignment. So what I'm going to do is just tune the radio dial. You'll see the capacitor move here until I find it, and there it is. So that's pointing to 1400 AM, so that's quite a ways off. So what I want to do is bring the dial back up to 1600. So now the radio is pointing right at 1600 AM. I'll turn up the volume, and I'm going to adjust the oscillator right here. So I'll adjust that adjustment. So here we go. Now I just want to adjust this until it gets to its loudest point. Right there. So now the dial is adjusted. Now the dials on these radios are never really super, super accurate. So as long as it's pointing very close to the number, you're doing pretty good. They're all American fives are usually like this. Now there are ways if you really want to spend some time with this, you can start trying to bend plates on the main tuning capacitor and everything, but you know, chances are this is going to be so close. It's not even worth doing that. So now if you remember earlier, we desensitized the receiver by turning this trimmer capacitor in here. So we want to bring the receive back again. So I'm just going to tune for a loudest signal. So I'll turn the volume up again. And I'll just turn this until it gets to its loudest point. Right there. So now the receiver is about as sensitive as it's going to get. It's gone through an entire alignment. Now you don't need to use a signal generator to align this one particular portion, the antenna portion, you can just tune for maximum static or maximum noise. So I'll turn the signal generator off and I'll turn the volume up and I'll give you an example here. So I'll detune it. Detune it again. Right there is maximum noise. So you can see it ends up in the exact same spot. So the radio is now completely aligned. Let's take a trip through the broadcast band. So as you can hear, the radio is really quiet. It has virtually no hum. So those two 47 microfarad capacitors that were installed are absolutely fine. So I'll turn the volume up here. You can hear with just a little bit of volume. It's really trying to receive. So here we go. I am, but the is deep down. Officers rest. That was after by the province. Maybe now, but uh, maybe aren't necessarily flush in the yes. You speak, just stay tuned. I think we're we're getting very close. So as you can hear, it's working very, very well. And that's just on a little internal rod antenna. And believe me, anything that doesn't have an external antenna here in the lab just really has a hard time receiving. And rod antennas are very directional as well. So if you have a radio with a rod antenna in it, it's not receiving the station that you want to hear very well. Try rotating the radio a little bit and see if you can get the radio station to come in just a little bit better. So all in all, I'm very, very happy with the project. It works very well. And the clock, everything is just functioning great. I'd show you how this lights up, but it's extremely dim with that neon bulb. So in order to see the clock dial, it would have to be in a very dark room. But the neon bulb was faulty, and uh, it does work now. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. Hope you enjoyed the explanation of this Atomic Era clock radio combination. If you did, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up 
and hang around. There'll be many more explanations like this coming in the near future, talking about all sorts of different electronics, technologies, vacuum tube stuff, and solid state alike. If you're really into this stuff, don't forget to hit the subscribe button as well. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level, I have an ongoing electronics course on Patreon right now. I'll link that just below this video in the description right about here. If you do go there, don't forget to check out the community section too. There's many people sharing their electronics projects there. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.